I thought for today, um, to be honest, when, when Rabina reached out and said, Michael, do you want to come speak at Social Media Day? The first thing that, that went through my mind was, was shit. Because, <laughs> and that's because I work for an organisation that, like I said, is a bank and, and it sits in a traditionally non-glamorous industry. And I mean, we've got some amazing speakers, right? How many people in this room want to stand around and, and listen to a bloke that works for a bank talk about making content? But like I said, we've got some amazing speakers. We've got people from the wine industry, the fitness industry, uh, food and manufacturing, the travel industry. And that presentation that Will just gave it, I work for a bank. Go figure. But therein lies where I thought that I'd be able to bring at least the smallest piece of value to you guys today. And that was to talk about what it's like to market a service in an industry which is perceived to be traditionally a non-glamorous industry. Obviously, there's been quite a lot of stuff happened over the last couple of years which have impacted the way we work and I'll go through the banking industry in a little bit but the banking industry is a very very interesting one because it's never had an issue with awareness and so it's what I find so interesting about the banking industry is that no matter what's going on in the world there's there's no issue with awareness there's a lack there's a serious consistency of the awareness everyone always knows the banks that are in in the market at that particular time and what this means on the flip side of that is that got all these very, very talented marketers creating some amazing work, some amazing advertising, some amazing content, which consumers, frankly, don't give a shit about. And so what I wanted to chat through today was how we've worked as the Bank Say marketing team over the last few years to try and reposition the brand in a way that our position in the market can guide the way that we actually make content. Um, and I'll go through how we've actually Try to, try to navigate our way through the industry because there is, as I'm sure you've all seen, a bit of cliche advertising over, over the last 18 months because of this little thing called COVID-19. Um, and in the, bit, in, in the banking industry, I'm, and I'm sure you guys who follow marketing opinion pieces and, and marketing news have seen quite a few opinions of how you should advertise during a pandemic or during a recession, and if you do advertise, what you should advertise. Um, and I just wanted to bring up a couple of examples um, or, or a bit of commentary around how to advertise. And the first one was from Peter Field. He has been dubbed the godfather of effectiveness and whilst it wasn't related to, to COVID-19, he talked back in 2008, 2009 at the GFC um, and he tracked some, some organisations, some American firms to see the impact of turning off your ad spend or reducing your ad spend during a recession and um, essentially his, his story was that brand building is not just about the now and you've always got to invest in the future and the results of his study showed that for those organisations that didn't invest in their brand when, when times were tough, um, whilst it's easier said than done, those that didn't suffered up for up, to, for up to five years following the recession. And that's backed up by Roland Bale and this is going back quite a while because this is going back to the Great Depression, so nearly 100 years ago, which is a bit ridiculous um, to go back that far, but he actually did a study off the back of um, the Great Depression in 1925 in America um, when he was doing his master's thesis at, at Harvard, and he looked at, once again, similar to Peter Field, the, the impact of a recession on, or uh, well, the impact of businesses reducing their ad spend during a time which the majority of businesses would also reduce their ad spend. Um, and effect, effectively, what the results showed was those companies that reduced their ad spend would see a decline in, in sales and profit both during and after the downturn, as opposed to those who either kept their ad spend the same or increased. Um, which makes sense, I think, when you think about it and you, and you put it up, essentially, spend more, you get more leads, right? But what, what's interesting about this is that essentially what's happening here is that your effective share of voice is increasing through this period. Um, and that means that you're obviously going to cut through to, to your target market a lot better. And then I'm going to go quote somebody who is South Australia's own here in Byron Sharp, who in September 2020, um, and this is a little bit more relevant for COVID, he actually referenced, he referenced what it's like for businesses to market during the pandemic. And he talked about how there's no better or there's, there's no value in coming out with something cliche during COVID and that the best type of advertising to do during a pandemic was no advertising. He termed it the incredible arrogance of marketers to, um, to think that they can change a consumer's perception when there's something 
a lot bigger going on. I think as marketers, that's something which we keep in mind that, you know, how much do we influence somebody's actions really? And certainly working for a bank, especially, you know, in an industry where there's, you know, this negative perception, we've gone from, you know, a Royal Commission in 2018, and then you've had all, all of this stuff with COVID and the natural disasters. There's, um, I guess, trying to work through how you position yourself in that market in a meaningful way and produce meaningful content is certainly a challenge. And I just wanted to, to highlight, because actually on Byron's point of talking about the COVID cliche, it's certainly something which, as a brand, we were very, very conscious of, and we wanted to try and avoid, um, you know, this this high awareness, low cut through. We wanted to be that high awareness, high cut through brand, um, which pretty much goes against the the industry norm. So looking at COVID advertising now. I hope this this video will work because I actually went looking for one particular example, and it is for, admittedly, another bank. Uh, they will remain nameless, but their colours are yellow and black. And, <laughs> and they, and they, oh, this will, and they actually came out with an ad which they've now taken down. I think because they realise it's too COVID cliche, but. It aligns itself with the we're here for you message which we saw so often during COVID, right? They it pretty much contained every COVID cliche that you could think of. It was set to powder fingers these days, so a very like beautiful song, like a cover of it. Um, and then it had pretty much the COVID cliche of your takeaway coffees, your homemade haircuts. Um, it had people getting dressed up to take their bins out, although I'm not sure anybody ever did that. And if you did, I'd probably question that one. But um, essentially what I'm saying here is that there's so much advertising which was the same and in the process of trying to look for this uh, particular ad, I found something which I think is even a little bit better. So, it's very North American, but I think you'll get the point. First opened our doors since 1926 since 1978 for 60 years for 75 years for over 80 years in 90 years for over 100 years nationwide has been on your side restaurants have always been there for you nissan has been with you through thick and thin we will do what we've always done take care of people we're people 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 and family 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 families are families families even now especially now especially now right now now more than ever more than ever today more than ever today more than ever in times like this at times like these during these difficult times in these troubled times challenging times trying times in these times of uncertainty during this time of great uncertainty during these uncertain times during these uncertain times in uncertain times in uncertain times uncertain times unprecedented times unprecedented times unprecedented times this unprecedented moment anyway i think everyone kind of gets the point right i think this is only half of the video i was debating whether i play the whole video just to get my point across even more but this goes on for another three minutes so we still find ways <laughs> so, I think it goes to show that, and hindsight is a wonderful thing, right? There's this knee-jerk reaction when, when the pandemic came that everyone was all about speed to market, um, and everyone thought that maybe that'd be a little bit unique, and it brings up this, the age-old debate of brand purpose, um, and whether that really is a legitimate thing for a brand to have, and whether it's something we as marketers tell ourselves um, to keep ourselves in a job, but I think it's interesting because the Bank SA team, and when we're looking to reposition the brand, we have a lot of things on our side which, which other, other banks don't. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we could align ourselves to have a legitimate brand purpose in a way that was meaningful for South Australians. And the outcome of that was that we would be able to align the content that we make with, our, with the insight and the brand purpose and what matters most to South Australians. So really the key for, for Bank SA was to differentiate ourselves from our customers to guide our content creation to stay close, even. So, in part of doing that, there's this process of devising a strategy and being a 170 plus year old bank, I know that's pretty much using a line from that video, but being a 170 year old bank, we 
had an issue of getting complacent um, and thinking that just because we've been around for 170 years, we'll be around for another 170 years. And that's obviously a very dangerous, very, very dangerous spot to be in. And I think part of this repositioning strategy, the most important thing that we did to kick off our process was to look internally. And this won't come as news to any of you all, right? You're all marketing professionals, all business owners um, who are well-versed in this. But I just want to give examples of what this meant for us. The first one there is playing to your strengths. And for bank to say, that was, like I said, this term of hyper-localization. We are the local bank. The fact that we have SA in the name of our company makes us feel like we've, had, you know, we've been granted permission to try and look after the state. And that second point is about studying the competition. Now that, sorry, to go back to that first point, it's to look at where we've got a competitive advantage. But that second point of studying your competitors is to see where your competitors have their competitive advantage. So using the banking industry, once again, as another example is Combank, or that yellow and, yellow and black bank, but they, they have a very strong digital experience, which frankly, bankers say doesn't have. Um, and you see, at the moment, there's all these digital and neo banks that are joining the banking industry, and what they're doing is, they've recognised that they don't have the legacy of, say, your bankers say, your Westpacs, your NABs, your AMZs, but what they have it's exactly that, no legacy. They don't have any legacy systems and they have the ability to treat the digital experience or look at the customer and recognise what the customer wants and base their operation completely around that. So what we're seeing from these companies is that they're treating their digital experience or the customer experience as a distinctive brand asset. And I think that opens up a, a, a debate around you know, brand thinking and design thinking as well. So it's a very unique competition at the moment. That third point there is we wanted to figure out how we could provide commercial value. Um, and this comes down, and I'll bring this up about trying to figure out how we had a legitimate brand purpose and one that was meaningful for South Australians. But I think in a bank, it's very easy to, to make things just because you can. And that's that fourth point there. But we really need to be looking at our consumers and aligning ourselves to the inside that our consumers are actually giving to us. Um, and some may think that it's a bank overplaying in a sector and, like I said before, you know, maybe they're being too arrogant about themselves and how much they can influence a consumer, but to align ourselves with a brand purpose that is legitimate and aligns to what our customers believe in or our target customers believe in, because we all know South Australians are quite a unique bunch, maybe it just works for us. So part of this uh, looking internally was to get our strengths, look at our competitors and figure out where we could play on our commercial value and I'll, I'll go into some of that. Um, in a second, but when we looked internally, the next step was obviously to, to know our customer, and this once again doesn't come as a surprise to any of you, right? All of you are, I'm sure, done a bunch of market research in your time, and it doesn't stop at market insight. It could be anything from you know demographic data, psychographic data. You could be looking at existing customer feedback. You could be looking at all the A/B testing that you've done in the past. If you've done any of that, what creative has worked for you in the best, but. But what we wanted to do from a strategy perspective was have a look at what is unique about the South Australian market, considering that's where we play. What that meant for us was doing a bunch of focus groups and a, and a bunch of um, in-depth research, interviewing South Australians to see what was meaningful for them. And the first point there is that South Australians are ridiculously patriotic about their state. I mean, we've got world-class wine regions with a 30-minute city. We've got the Port Adelaide Football Club. <laughs> <laughs> we've got amazing beaches. We've got the second biggest fringe festival in the world. And I know that... Actually, there was this article that came out about a month ago, and I'm sure you probably all would have seen it. It was about how Adelaide's the third most livable city in the world. You best believe when the pandemic's over and I go overseas and people ask me where I'm from, I don't say Adelaide. I'll say the third most livable city in the world. And that's, I feel like, a very, very common theme among South Australians. We're very, very proud of where we've come from. And that leads me to that second point of hyper-local isn't a thing in South Australia. A lot of the time, especially in the banking industry, um, we've been compared to Sydney um, or, or Melbourne. And in Sydney, you know, you've got your northern beaches, you've got your inner city, you've got the eastern suburbs, um, you've got greater western Sydney, so you've got all these different pockets around the city, but we all know that as the 30-minute city, everyone can travel in South Australia somewhere 
um, where they want to go, if the experience or if the food's good enough, then somebody will travel there. Um, I mean, people go down to Port Elliot once a month to get a donut, right? <laughs> so this level of hyperlocalization, and I think COVID put a bit of a magnifying glass on it, is that we should be supporting local. Um, but it's something which we've always been doing in South Australia. So that, that, was a, that was a big insight for us. And that third point there is about business and consumer crossover. And as part of the business bank work that we do at Bank SA, we actually do a thing called the Business Focus magazine as well. And there was a, an insight in there very recently which talked about the business and consumer crossover. Nearly 95% of total businesses in South Australia are small to medium businesses. And I don't think, I'm sure there's a bunch of you in the audience as well which which sit within this 95%, right? But I don't think that comes as a surprise to us, and it's not to say that B2B and B2C marketing you know, should be treated exactly the same, because they shouldn't. But I think it shows that if you can influence one, that you've got a good chance of influencing the other and connecting with the same customer in a meaningful way. And I think that's quite unique to South Australia. And that fourth point there is that our people are a resource. So South Australia, even pre-COVID, had less than 1% population growth um, in the last couple of years. And I, I know that there's probably plans to, to change that, but what that says to us is that a lot of the growth has to come from internal. It has to come from where we are. I mean, South Australians like to claim people that have lived here for more than three months. So um, the people are a resource, and we've got to rely on the interconnectedness of the Australian community. You always hear about this two degrees of separation um, in South Australia, and I think that... That's a very key point as to how we can focus on collaborating um, and leveraging some key partnerships. And so on to the work that we actually, we actually created. So the repositioning of Bank SA, like I said before, was to try and give ourselves a brand purpose that would guide some, guide some content. Now, we're very, very wary of having a brand purpose which maybe looked a little ingenuine. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that not only was it a creative execution which aligned with our customer insight, but that we could walk the talk. Um, and that goes back to that point of providing commercial value and being able to prove that to our people. So what you can see here is our brief to our agency was to be a catalyst for growth in South Australia. And this is the result here where it literally changed one letter in the name of the bank. So it went from Bank SA to We Back SA, um, which is an unmissable call to arms for South Australians and to drive growth in South Australia. And this could easily be seen as kind of that smoke and mirrors. So I just want to go, in, uh, go into a little bit deeper about how we wanted to, to walk the talk, so to speak, um, and provide that commercial value. And I think actually Will made a great point before as well, talking about how we don't want to market to, we want to market with. Um, our consumers, so this is almost a thinking behind a lot of this, is that we wanted to align ourselves on that insight as well. So going into the collaboration side of things and, and leveraging our partnerships, South Australia, or, or Bank of Say rather, is very, very lucky, and I, I admit this, that we have two very unique sponsorship assets at the moment. Um, we sponsor as the principal partner the Adelaide Fringe and have so have done so for the last 16 years, and we also sponsor the Royal Adelaide Show as a principal partner and have done for 26 years. Now, obviously, that's all, that's all pre-COVID. Um, like that, we had those sponsorships pre-COVID is what I mean. But I think the important thing to note here is that the level of interconnectedness in the South Australian community means that collaboration can be amplified to a whole new level in South Australia. It goes back to that two degrees of separation that I talked about before. Um, and how we can leverage that. And the benefit of collaborating in South Australia is that, of course, we get new content opportunities, you get new content ideas, you get new networks, you get increased brand recognition, and it's all stuff which is so, so valuable in this day and age. And I think the Banker Safe Adelaide Fringe Partnership is, is a good example of this because you don't, like, a bank and a fringe festival, you think, are the two polar opposites, right? Like, you wouldn't think that a partnership between them would work, but I'll go into it in a second. But we knew the impact that the Adelaide Fringe has on the local economy, and a bank can't go hold an arts festival. So 
been able to align ourselves to what mattered most to South Australians. And like I said, everyone's so proud of the Fringe Festival. Why wouldn't we align ourselves to that and try and make them even bigger? And we actually presented at the World Fringe Congress last year um, and presented on how a corporation like a bank can partner with an arts festival and it be mutually beneficial. And the number one point that came out of that was the alignment on shared objectives. So in South Australia, what is a problem for you is likely a problem for another, and that's just the way we are. And so focusing on that collaboration and tackling the problem together and relying on that shared resource with a shared objective was key. So into what we looked like at the fringe. So we obviously wanted to provide this commercial value, and we knew that the fringe did exactly that. You can see there, th these stats are actually from the 2021 festival, which I think it's quite amazing because all over the world, this was the centre of the arts world, right? Like at this point in time, there was no other event like this that could actually occur. And they've gone and had f over 5,000 artists play at the Fringe. You've had over 630,000 tickets sold, 4,400 jobs created, and a gross economic impact of $56 million. Like how insane is that, that during COVID, that an arts festival can still produce that? And so aligning ourselves with the Fringe and recognising that the partnership actually goes a lot beyond the sponsorship fee. It's not we give you X amount of dollars to try and push your event forward. It's working in tandem to try and achieve those shared objectives. Um, now, the Fringe obviously have objectives around, around tickets sold, um, but there's a level of integration that, that we can do from a bank to, to try and allow Bank SA to, to leverage that as well. And then going on to that second partnership as well, it's Bank Say and the Royal Adelaide Show. Like I said, this is the 26th year this year coming up that this, th this partnership has actually happened. And you can see that even though it didn't go ahead in 2020, the, the amount of attendees that actually go is over 500,000. So it's one of the biggest events on the South Australian calendar. And that gross economic impact, whilst it's an annual one by the Royal Adelaide Horticultural Society, it's over $300 billion to the local economy. And I think it's important to point this out because we talk about that commercial value and how a bank could actually provide commercial value. In no way do I want to be trying to claim that this is what we're providing, but we've aligned ourselves to try and make this the best event it can be and do what a bank can do um, to try and give ourselves a meaningful way to get behind what matters most to South Australians. And then throughout all of this, we knew, like I mentioned, we had these two existing sponsorship assets, which were very, very unique. And the repositioning of the brand, which we realised, because we were getting a little bit complacent, we realised that we shouldn't just stop at what we already had with the Fringe Festival partnership. And we shouldn't just stop with the Royal Adelaide Show partnership. So in 2019, we produced, that's the 2020 version up there, but we produced uh, the Back SA Christmas gift guide. Essentially what it was, was a 40-page publication released on pageant day each year, which featured local gifts from local consumers um, and South Australian businesses, which we wanted consumers to actually go and shop at. So it had you know, your gifts for kids, it had your gifts for mum, gifts for dad, gifts for your teachers, it had unique recipes created by famous local South Australian chefs that had unique experiences, which were created by South Australians in which every South Australian should go experience. And the point of this is, is like I said, to, to go a little bit above and beyond and do something a little bit selfless for the bank, which will hopefully drive business for these local customers. And I think we, we very, very often get stuck in this, get stuck in this rut, um, and we certainly did when we repositioned the brand around how do we create content that is, that is meaningful and completely original. Now, my managers and everyone at the bank won't like me coming out and saying this, but we, of course, took inspiration for the Back of Say Christmas gift guide. Um, the Amex Shop Small campaign and the Visa Where You Shop Matters campaign were very much used as inspiration for this, and I don't think there's any shame in admitting that Great ideas are exactly that, great ideas. And there's a book that I actually read recently from Austin Leon. I'm sure a couple of people in the audience have read it. 
And it talks about stealing like an artist and about how nothing is original. Now, I'm not going to say go plagiarise everybody's work because <laughs> that's not what we want to do. But he makes a great point that you can go out and take inspiration and put your own spin on things to make content that's meaningful and, and drive your own business outcomes with your own spin. And that's certainly something which we try to do for Bank SA. We wanted to align ourselves to what mattered most to South Australians and that was driving the local economy in South Australia and how we repositioned ourselves and the insight that we got drove the content that we created. Granted, we had two unique sponsorship assets that we could leverage, but we've created content around them and then we've created a new piece of content, which was the Christmas gift guide. And the Christmas gift guide is something which I am very, very proud of, to be honest. I, like, I don't want to come up here pumping out new tyres, but we actually won a Content Marketing Campaign of the Year Award in 2021, which for a bank was, like, we were very, very shocked as well. But I think it, that was proof to us that even in a non-glamorous industry, you can create content which is meaningful for customers um, and that people actually want to engage with. And it goes far beyond a brand purpose for the bank. Um, and obviously, I'm not going to lie, there's a benefit to business outcome as well. So that is, I, th I think I might have actually, I might have raced through that a little bit too quick. Maybe I stopped the video a little bit too early, but um, that pretty much wraps up the presentation for how Bank of Say has repositioned itself in the South Australian market over the last few, few years. And I hope that gives a little bit of an insight into the journey that we went on. Um, more than happy to have a conversation with anyone who's, who's got any specific questions around our insight on South Australia. And um, yeah, hopefully that was a quite helpful one for you. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. That was great. Um, banks are not boring, <laughs> although they are helpful. Uh, that's actually a really good tip. Um, that you have in your little black box over there. Helpful things are really boring. Um, I think Will's content in particular, the, the Canva video, um, yeah, like I think that's kind of why that works because it was fast, it was quick, but ultimately helpful because, oh my gosh, I can see how that feature would work. It's literally as easy as one, two, three, press those buttons. Um, does anyone have any questions for Michael from Bank SA? Um, I actually do have a question yes. for you. Please. Um, so, working in a large organisation uh, where you know there are multiple layers of, uh, I guess, management. Yep. How do you go about creating content on a day-to-day -day basis, or how does the team go about doing that? Yes. And uh, what kind of approval processes do you have? Um, it's a really dry question, but I actually really like to hear yeah. how that works and whether there's a bit of autonomy or. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Over to you. Um, early and consistent stakeholder engagement is the key to the bank, certainly. Um, yeah, no, it's certainly a great question because I think with all of this back SA work, the key and, and what was most useful for us in terms of getting this content um, out the door and speed to market, especially when, when you need to be quick to market, was we brought the leadership team and, and those people that essentially make the decisions along you know, on the journey of the reason why we repositioned the brand. Um, it certainly wasn't just a marketing team decision to reposition the bank, and I think that alignment on shared objectives um, for the bank and that, that greater purpose with the leadership team and there being no question over what the intention of the bank was, um, I think that was key. And it actually brings up a good point as well that it's not all about, yeah, a marketing campaign. It's certainly more than just that, it's about especially in a bank, it goes to service as well. And so actually being able to reflect the actions of the brand that you want to be um, goes way beyond advertising and marketing and having a line, alignment in the, bank, in the banking industry, that certainly helps. Yeah, cool. Looks like we've got a question from Will. Yeah. Just wait for the mic, please. And epic. Uh, thanks, Michael, good presentation. Um, just a quick one. So I noticed, I'm not sure if it was covered, but um, I noticed that you, like Bank of has particularly used the piping strike, yes. like in a lot of the new, uh, like, uh, TV ads in particular that I've seen. Um, in a similar way, I guess, talking about the inspiration kind of thing, like the compare the meerkat market yeah. kind of ad. Um, could you just, like, 
broadly explain that? I guess. Yeah, so Piping Shrike is a very polarizing character. Um, <laughs> it's very interesting. We've actually got some of our ad tracking results back in. The commentary is always very funny to read because you get people saying, I love the bird, Piping Shrike is humor, haha. <laughs> but then you get people being like, <laughs> so, um, when we actually went through in 2015 to create Piper and Trike, it was to make something a little bit more memorable for the brand. Um, I think all too often we recognise that a lot of banks look the same and sound the same, and, and Piper and Trike gave us a unique voice. And actually, when we launched the campaign, I'm not sure if anyone remembers back to 2015, but it wasn't actually aligned with Bank SA at the start of the campaign. He came out and he was this spokesperson. Um, I shouldn't say cheerleader, but he was a spokesperson for South Australia and his mascot for South Australia and talked about how great South Australia was, but nobody knew he was aligned to Bank SA. So this whole campaign was with the intention that, you know, Bank SA is here for South Australians and so is Pipe and Truck and therefore they teamed up to, to help create you know, a great South Australia. So, um, like you said, he's quite a unique device, kind of like the compare the market. Um, but yeah, it's something which we've certainly relied on over the last couple of years to try and differentiate ourselves and add a little bit of humour, I think. Like I said, in the bank, it's all too often you see content which is maybe too similar um, and being able to have a, least, a little bit of flexibility. Um, yeah, it's, it's a good, good vehicle to try and use. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Great, thanks for that, Will. Any other follow-up questions for Will? Oh, sorry, not for Will. Actually, we can probably take some for Will too. We've got a bit of time. Ah. Um, sorry, I think there was one. Is there one, one up there. over here? Yes, perfect. And there's another one down here as well. Great. I just. Hey, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I um, I'd just be interested to hear about how you measure the return on on investment on the sponsorships with the Fringe and the show. Yeah. No. Great question, and it's something which we have a lot of questions internally about as well because I think. <laughs> um, when you look at the fringe and you say that there's been over 630,000 tickets sold, it's easy to be like, oh yeah, that campaign was a success. Um, <laughs> but obviously that's the fringe, not us. Um, from a fringe perspective, I think it changes from sponsorship to sponsorship. Um, we obviously have our own objectives. For example, during the fringe, we have 25% off all fringe to all selected shows um, if you're a Bank Say customer. So trying to focus on getting customers to use their Bank Say card um, during the fringe and increasing that over a period of time, um, sorry, year to year, was how we actually measured our return on investment. Um, I, I guess it's one of our key messages. For the brand element, um, we focus on key metrics like awareness and consideration, um, and especially looking at our target market, which is a little bit of that younger demographic now um, in South Australia. So, um, yeah, it's a bit of a mix of things, and I think the key for us over the last couple of years has been consistency in what we've measured and consistency in offers as well through both partnerships. I think we had another question just here. Um, Rachel's just going to come up with the mic. Uh, the Royal Commission's exposed some pretty bad behaviour and uh, so how has that impacted on you and how has that it then informed what you've done going forward uh, yeah. as far as your marketing's concerned? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. So, um, 2018, a Royal Commission into the banking and financial services industry. Uh, I'm sure we can recognise there's probably few worse things for an industry to try and bring a brand out of something which is so negative. Um, and I think the first thing, and we actually talked about this as a marketing team, was we didn't want to try and pretend like we could solve the issues for the Royal Commission, right? We're not that arrogant to go and say that we can go change the perception of the bank. Um, and so the alignment with our retail network, our people that actually go serve customers, was the most important thing. So that consistency, um, or sorry, the, the alignment with other functions of our business who actually relied on giving good service to our customers, um, was how we wanted to try and position ourselves as a marketing team. Now, obviously there's a lot of work that goes on outside of the marketing team and it's not my place to speak for the bank, but it's, a, it's obviously a journey to get to the point where you obviously can't read the damage that was happening during that, but um, yeah, it's certainly a journey for, for the bank as a wider organisation. And when we repositioned ourselves, that was in the back of our mind, but it wasn't the catalyst for why we repositioned ourselves. The catalyst was we looked at the inside of what South Australians wanted, and we wanted to align ourselves with that, and we need to make sure that our service matched what we were saying. Great. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, looks like we've got one from David over here. 
Uh, I think, Rachel, you're probably closer. Only just. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm curious what you think about marketing from other banks. Um, so, for example, I keep seeing an ad from Westpac, which is all fire rescue helicopters and emergencies, and it seems like they're kind of focusing on being there for people during bad times, whereas Bank SA seems to be focusing you know, on fringe and royal shows during all the good times. Mm. Um, do you see any benefit in their marketing approach compared to Bank SA's? I think what is, when I talked about playing to our strengths, the strength that Bank SA has is obviously that level of localization which you talked about, which is why we can rely on, say, the fringe, the royal show, um, response to the Port Adelaide Football Club as well, which is, I guess that's kind of how we form our brand image, but other banks, for example, like Westpac, I think maybe they are a little bit all the same um, in some sense, and it's certainly not a bad thing, but they've got their own advantages with their service, with their digital experience, which I think helps bring to the forefront just how useful of a brand they can be, and perhaps their utility is actually you know, stronger than some banks, um, like Bank SA, but Westpac actually have recently gone through a major rebrand as well. Um, so I'm not sure if anyone has seen their new TVC, um, but that was certainly focused around, yeah, that being there in the moments that matter and, and helping people, but I think it's a little bit of a dangerous territory sometimes to focus on maybe the negative or um, kind of what, what has gone on. Obviously, we need to talk about it, but Certainly, the tack that we've taken with Bank SA is to focus on the positive forward. Okay, I think we'll take one more if there is one more question. Okay, I think it looks like we've exhausted the audience. I'd like to just welcome Will Giles back because I just realised I forgot to give him his wine. So, Will, could you come join us at the front of the thing? If you could please give applause for our first set of speakers. Will Giles from Tilted and Marcus Pavel.